Hi, everybody. So today, you heard, I will talk about the obesity pandemic. This is really an enormous challenge for the whole world. And for me, it's also a challenge for the lipidomics research community. So the COVID pandemic is, of course, the one we hear about all the time. And if you look at the numbers, the global COVID case tally now exceeds 400 million. How does that compare with the obesity pandemic? So in 2020, more than 2 billion adults, 39% of the adult global population were overweight with a BMI over 25. And of these, over 600 million were obese, a BMI over 30. And Europe is not better than the rest of the world. Uh, WHO published a report uh, in May and uh, reveals that overweight and obesity rates have reached epidemic promotion proportions across the whole region and their values are still escal escalating. In the European region, 59%, 59% of the adults and almost one in three children are overweight or living with obesity. And if you look at the, the, the risk factors for severe COVID disease, age is number one, obesity is number two. So here again, it's affecting the whole world population. So we have to ask ourselves, what has led to the obesity pandemic? Now, after the second world war, the coronary death rate went down. It was bad, little food, people were almost fasting. And then in the 1950s, uh, uh, you, they already, uh, 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 the death uh, uh, rates increased, were on the rise. And only then a fight started between the researchers in the fat and in the sugar camps, and uh, they were fighting for who's to blame, fats or sugars. Angel Keys said fat is the problem, and Jod Jodkin says sugar is the problem. So who is Angel Keys? He was a physiologist in the United States, and uh, uh, he was well known all over in the media at that time. And he, one of his famous studies was the seven country study uh, 1970, seven countries, you see them all here, they had a direct correlation between, showed a direct correlation between the fat, I mean, animal fat consumption and the, and the mortality in coronary disease. So he came up with cholesterol plus fat equals heart disease. Now, John Judkin was the sugar contender and he uh, was a very British scientist, very careful and, and did very good work. And he published a book, Pure, White and Deadly, The Problem of Sugar in 1972. Now, okay, Asian Keys won the fight in the 1970s. He became the main advisor of a Senate committee chaired by the George McGovern, a senator, that decided in 1977 to recommend that the fats should be lowered in the diet in the United States. They also listened to John Yudkin, but he made no impression on them. It was Angel Keys who won uh, uh, the day. And what happened then after lipids were removed from the food? Well, the amazing thing was that things got worse. And the food industry, they complied right away. They removed fats from their products and often replaced them with corn syrup, fructose, and also the sugar content was increased in uh, soft drinks. And you see it still today in the supermarkets, low fat, no fat, all is there still. And what happened to uh, the obesity pandemic in the United States? You see here, look at 1985. Everything is blue. 2008 is going into towards red. And 2016, it looks pretty bad. 
And today the BMI is over 30 uh, uh, for 40% of the population, 40%. And there are differences. Japan has only 3.6%. And if you look at uh, the values more closely, you realize that the, the obesity in women and in, in men started to increase in the beginning of the 80s and we're going up and going up and going up. And, and, and here you first, it was the women who had more obesity and now uh, it uh, looks like, in the, uh, yeah, like, like the men are taking over. So here you have a trend which is just continuing. And the worst is of course that, that, that obesity can give rise to disease. Not only COVID, serious COVID disease, but myocardial infarction, diabetes type two, fatty liver, and even cancer. So obesity is a bigger risk factor for cancer than smoking is today. And if you look at the total cost for the USA annually, it's 200 billion in extra health costs and 150 million in dollars for lost productivity. And loss of productivity, meaning that you cannot work and you lose, uh, 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 we lose productivity in this way, could be as high as 580 billion annually by 2030. And if you look at the leading causes of death, look at 1900s. The three leading causes of death are all infectious diseases. And here, 2019 later, it is uh, coronary disease. And the third one is obstructive pulmonary disease due to the pollution in the world. And if you look at, at England, 2016, and the three main uh, uh, diseases that cause death, heart disease, dementia, and lung cancer for males, and dementia, heart disease, and stroke for females. So age, obesity, and diabetes are risk factors for the leading causes of death. Age is not modifiable, but obesity and diabetes are modifiable. So Angel Keys was wrong, something uh, uh, in his advice, something went uh, really wrong with the, with the fat lowering and sugar, we you know today is the real culprit. John Judkin was right. Our lives have been changed by fast foods, snacks and soft drinks that make our metabolism go over. So you can see science was not innocent in the genesis of the obesity pandemic. And obviously we have a problem to solve. So ancient Keys uh, seven uh, country study, he left out at that time, France. France, as you know, the French eat a lot of cheese. They still eat 27 kilograms per cheese per person today, but they had high fat, animal fat consumption, but very low coronary death. And there were other problems as well. And uh, uh, still that was the advice that was given. And here we are. The industry is bombarding us with processed foods and snacks and soft things. And at some stage, our metabolic controls cannot handle this anymore. And our metabolism goes awry. And we now have to get to work to understand the pathogenesis of the metabolism that goes awry. This metabolism is caused by our unhealthy lifestyle. Yeah, metabolic changes in the body give rise to this metabolism. And obviously lipids are involved. And the question is, can lipidomics provide clues? Is the plasma lipidome reflecting metabolic changes that are caused by overweight and obesity? Okay, we had a look at that. Uh, it was uh, Matthias Gall in, uh, in, 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 in Lipotype, and we were collaborating with, uh, with, uh, with Malmö and, and, and Helsinki, and we now want to see if we can see reflection of the body weight in the, in the plasma lipidome. And here you see the two cohorts we have. One is FinRISC. It is from the, the Finnish Institute for Welfare and Health. Uh, and here is the Malmö one, which is from the a big population-based cohort, uh, the Malmö Diet and Cancer Cardiovascular Study. And you see that here are the, 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 the two cohorts. And you see that the FinRISC is somewhat younger and Malmö, and you see that uh, uh, that the values of total cholesterol is higher in the Malmö study 
the more aged uh, population, and also the total triglyceride is not really uh, significant. And then uh, you can also see it reflected in the HDL cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. And now um, the idea is, was to use a total of about 1,000 uh, um, from the FinRISC cohort study. And there we have a training, uh, 800 uh, persons and test 200 persons. And then we have a validation cohort, the Malmö cohort. And now we try to find out, can we predict obesity? And if you look at the results, then you can see here, BMI is not so good. And you go, then you have the waist, waist circumference or the waistip ratio is better, but the best is the body fat percentage. That is really quite good, uh, well predicted by the lipidome. And if you look then at the, uh, the, the, the error rates here, you see how it all works, and you see that the validation in the Malmö cohort also worked. So very interesting is when you look now at, here is the, 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 uh, all the, uh, the, the, the study, here we see the observed BMI, and here is the predicted BMI, and you can see many of them lie on this line, uh, good correlation, but let's look at this uh, interval here between around 25 BMI, still un, uh, lower overweight and going towards obesity. And you can see here that these outliers, these the yellow ones, they have a predicted BMI from the lipidome, which is higher than the observed. And if you look at the clinical values of those, they are worse. So these are now, uh, 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 you can see from the outliers that they can give us uh, uh, clues for what's going to happen. And if you look now at the, the out, how the epidomis outperforms, uh, 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 then you can see here the lipid data A, there is no additional input. B, you add the clinical laboratory variables and B and C are both. And here is no lipids. Here is just the clinical values. Here is the, the lipid categories and the lipid classes, but the best are the lipid subspecies, the plasma lipidome here. It is much better uh, uh, than everything else. And uh, uh, therefore we can see here that we have methods to look at obesity, which are very primitive, BMI, waist hip ratio, or waist circumference. They have much better is body fat percentage and that you measure by myoelectrical impedance. And then best of them all is the metabolic analysis using lipid analysis. And we can therefore summarize that the body fat percentage and the waist hip ratio are better predicted than the BMI by the lipidome. And the modeling of the base of the body fat percentage is very good with 8% error of the range and 70% of the variability explained. And it is the lipid species detail. You need the, the, the mass spectrometric analysis that is needed for accurate modeling. And outliers in clinical profiles uh, seem to predispose for obesity-related diseases. And the idea is, can we stratify obesity to predict the future health risk in the future? So let's look at the plasma lipidomics further. Now, can plasma lipidomics differentiate between health and disease? I won't go through all the data. There's lots of studies showing that disease like diabetes type 2, coronary um, uh, disease, uh, Alzheimer, multiple sclerosis, uh, fatty liver, cancer, they are all giving changes in the plasma lipidome. So really something uh, going on, the body is reflected in the plasma lipidome. And here is just one example and this is just uh, from the Malmö study with uh, 3,800 uh, people. And here we looked, can plasma lipidomics differentiate between non-smokers and smokers? So here are the never smokers. And with the 77 probability, we can uh, identify those who never smoked. And with 74% probability, we can identify the smokers. So even smoking can be seen in the plasma. So our working hypothesis is that the blood lipidome is a generalized measure of the metabolic status. And if you look at it more closely, 
it is interesting that the plasma lipidome has predictive power years before disease incidence. So now we take the Malmö study, this with Ulle Melander, Malmö diet and cancer cardiovascular study. And here we have 3,800 uh, people who were, the, the, the blood samples were taken between 1993 and 1996, and 39% um, of the, well, if you look at them, uh, 48 plus 39% were healthy at the time the plasma samples were taken and 13 had prevalent disease. But out of these healthy, 48% uh, uh, had incident conditions, coronary disease, stroke, heart failure, metabolic disease, diabetes, dementia, and cancer. And uh, uh, so we now know which uh, of these people who had a plasma sample taken in 1993, 96 turned ill. And we, we see here that the biggest group is the diabetes group, and the second biggest is the coronary events. So let's look at them. So now we take diabetes. So there are about four, over 400 diabetes, diabetes type 2 cases during the 20 years that followed after the plasma samples have been taken. And you can see there's a group with high predictability. We can predict that the diabetes with high predictability where the true positive rate is 84%. And you see it, it differs from the controls. You see that in the direction of higher predictability, we have a hump here, and in the controls, we have very little. So stratifying type 2 diabetes causes uh, uh, cases using model prediction probabilities. And now, uh, the amazing thing was that if you look, there's no correlation between T2D, the diabetes type 2D prediction probability and time to diagnosis. So it was there from the beginning. And, 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 and we have now here the lipidome signature, uh, the lipids that are, are predictable, predicting the disease, and we see them in the usual way. And we did the same thing for coronary events. Again, we have a hump here towards the high predictability, so here you see 109 uh, that had a high uh, out of the three over 300 that a high predictability gain 85 percent highly predictable compared to the controls where you see that the hump is not there. So again, no correlation for coronary event prediction and time to the diagnosis. And again, we get a lipidome signature. There are some overlap with the diabetes signature, but many of the lipids are different. Now let's compare. You know that today, uh, almost for every disease, we identify the geneticists, they identify genes associated with disease based on small variations in the genome called single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, genome-wide association studies, GWAS. And there you then find in the whole chromosome set, you find uh, regions in the chromosome with, with, with SNPs, which are correlated with disease and have a higher risk uh, for getting the disease. Now, we now compare from this Malmö study where a G was, was done and we calculate the polygenic risk score uh, for, uh, for each patient, for each person in the study, and, and we just add them all up. There's a way of doing this. And we did the same for the, lipidome, uh, the lipidomes and add, so the risk uh, according to what we had shown before. And then we took the 3,800 and divided them up into 380 D cells. And then here uh, towards the left, uh, you will see these are the low risk ones. And here between 90 to 100%, we have the high risk ones. And uh, so we have 380 persons in this group. And you can see that the lipidomic risk score is close to 40%, whereas the polygenic risk score is much lower, 25%. So you can see here that the lipidomic risk score is giving a very good uh, uh, readout for, for, for the risk of, of, of getting uh, incident diabetes. And interesting, when you look at the, you compare the lipidomics versus the polygenic risk scores, and you, you, you look at them, 
there is no correlation, I'm a very weak. Uh, 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 that means that they are not additive. Polygenic risk measures something else than the lipidomic risk. So therefore we summarize that in diabetes type two and also in coronary disease, the plasma lipidome can exhibit changes that probably reflect metabolic difference in the body that give rise to a risk signature years before incident disease. So you can compare it to blood pressure. This, uh, let's look at the, the remember that these are, these were not, young people were not in these studies. The, the mean age was, was, was uh, getting to, towards uh, 50 and 60. And, and, and therefore, uh, uh, when the study started, they, many of them had high blood pressure, but they didn't have, 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 have coronary disease yet or, 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 or other diseases called by blood pressure. And so the same thing with the lipidome, it gives you a readout before disease uh, uh, occurs. So very, a great thing is that the lipidomic risk score is phenotypic. That means that if we would have followed with, we, we had only the, the, the people over the years, we could have seen how they change. And therefore this is really a potentially a very powerful aid to help people navigate their lifestyle and much more predictive, predictive than the polygenic risk score that everyone is using now. So how could the blood lipids reflect what is going happening in the organs of the body? You know, of course, that cholesterol and triglycerides are very good biomarkers in the blood. But uh, what are we measuring really? So we are measuring the lipids in the plasma, in this case, and the lipids in the plasma that we measure are bound in the lipoproteins. These are the circulating lipid protein complexes uh, that are very important uh, uh, in, in the distribution uh, uh, of lipids in the body. So if you take an LDL type of a uh, low density lipoprotein type of a, of, a, of a lipoprotein, it has a monolayer of, uh, uh, of, of lipids, phospholipids, sphingolipids, uh, cholesterol, and then the inside is a hydrophobic core of triglycerides and cholesterol esters. And if you look at the LDL system, the LDL is secreted as a very low density lipoprotein, which is then uh, which is much bigger than the LDL, which is then uh, fatty acid are cleaved off. And then you have an LDL that circulates around and is taken up by cells in the periphery, by extrahepatic tissues over the LDL receptor system. And this was thought is, of course, delivering cholesterol to cells, but it's also delivering a lot of other lipids and they have not taken in, been taken into account. And the HDL system is in the other direction. So uh, the HDL APOA, for instance, the apoprotein is secreted by the liver, very lipid poor, and then it circulates and binds to, to cells where there's an ABCA receptor. And then it turns, it takes lipids, cholesterol, yes, and other lipids from the plasma membrane of cells in the periphery on the extrahepatic tissues. So you have one system delivering lipids, and another system taking away lipids. And the HDL is really a fantastic, the high density lipid uh, protein family. Very little is known. There are a number of different APOA, A, B, C, D, and so on. And, and this enormous capability of, 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 of taking a disc, it takes a bilayer disc over the ABCA receptor in the plasma membrane or the peripheral cells and then it covers the perimeter of the disc so that it stays uh, uh, hydro soluble and hydrophilic. And then uh, 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 there are enzymes that uh, esterify cholesterol and then it turns into a spherical particle. So our hypothesis is that the plasma lipoproteins function as a surveillance, delivery and retrieval system. They could function as nanosensors to regulate lipid homeostasis. And this is why it could make sense that the blood lipidome might serve as a measure of the generalized metabolic status. So the idea is that we have a system from the outside that delivers lipids and takes away lipids to help to keep the lipid homeostasis within normal range in every cell. 
And homeostasis is the process how key physiological parameters are maintained in a predefined range by feedback mechanism. So lipids play an important role in responding and buffering against the dysfunctional metabolism. But somewhere along the line, a tipping point is reached, resulting in disease when we are bombarded by fast foods, snacks, and soft drinks. So this system then when goes out of balance, then you cause this metabolism in the in, in healthy tissues and, and, and uh, 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 the tissue uh, uh, is damaged so that the metabolism changes and therefore you get this metabolic uh, dis dysfunction. And metabolism, of course, is a very important process in, in, in our bodies. And it was very much neglected during the DNA revolution in the uh, 80s, 90s, uh, 2000s. Now it's coming back in with full speed and we have to learn much more about metabolism. So metabolism, there are three main purposes, conversion of the energy in food uh, uh, to, be, to run cellular processes and the conversion of food to building blocks for synthesis of proteins, lipids, nucleic acids and carbohydrates and the elimination of metabolic waste. And of course the lipids play a central role here. And we are still, we only know fragments here and there. We don't understand the system as a whole. As you know, systems biology is the, 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 the motto of the day, but very little progress is still being made. We have lots of thing, work to do. And now when the dysmetabolic metabolic tissues uh, 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 are, 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 are caused, uh, are uh, affected, uh, by the by the metabolism in such a way that they can be 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 uh, uh, recognized by inflammation mechanism there is an inflammatory response and the inflammatory response comes from the innate immune system which is the oldest of our uh, uh, immune uh, uh, defenses as and there are cellular components like, components like phagocytic cells dendritic cells and natural killer cells and then there are sensors, receptors to recognize non-cells and damaged cells. And the innate immune response induces defense response and promotes the repair of damaged tissue. But also this response can go wrong. And the, this metabolism in our cells can lead to an attack that the whole system is not uh, a defense anymore, but it's attacking us and causing disease. So now, when you think about the lipids, we all know that they make a very important uh, uh, contribution to cell membrane function. And if we know, we know that cell membranes are central hubs of cellular metabolism and have to be kept functional. And that means that the lipid composition is regulated to stay within normal range. And the cellular lipidomes contain hundreds of distinct lipid molecular species. And one reason for the tight control are phase separating lipid rafts. So if you look at the lipid raft concept, you know that in the exoplasmic leaflet, sphingolipids and cholesterol form assemblies and they interact with the inner leaflet, which has a, has a different lipid composition, also interacting, forming an assembly in both, connected in both uh, leaflets. And this therefore means that the, the lipid species play a very important role in keeping these uh, this, this uh, subcompatibilization principle uh, functional. And then this, this, this small rafts uh, uh, dynamic appearing and disappearing are part of, of, of cellular metabolism and, and other functions in the cell. And, and therefore the lipids play an important role. And, uh, and, and, and one reason why uh, we, 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 we have to, to we have to keep the lipids so tightly regulated is to keep the, the lipid rafts uh, functional. Now, as you remember, in the, from the beginning of the talk, science was not innocent, innocent in the analysis of the obesity pandemic. And obviously we have a problem to solve. And the amazing thing is that so little work is being done to get at the roots of the, of the dysmetabolism that is causing the problems uh, 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 for the people who are who are getting unhealthy uh, by their weight. We have to get to work to understand the pathogenesis of this metabolism caused by our unhealthy lifestyle. So scientists have a little problem with lifestyle, but that should, should has to stop. 
we have to understand what goes on. And since it's the lifestyle, especially our diet, that is causing this, we have to get to work. And we really need an assay for this metabolism that can warn us before the homostasis gets out of hand and causes inflammatory attacks. We have no assay yet. And here, lipotype comes into the picture. Lipidomics for a better life. We have this platform, shotgun lipidomics, and it's a fully integrated and reproducible high throughput shotgun lipidomics platform, high technical precision, high throughput, fast lipid identification, and very good quantification, not absolute, but, uh, but close, and optimal for large scale clinical lipidomics screening. So we now want to introduce a new health measure, the blood lipidome. The blood lipidome, we hope, will be a fingerprint of our health status. A drop of blood on a piece of paper, prepared in a dried, this dried blood spot sent to us. Then we do a lipidome and, uh, and then we uh, analyze the lipidome. So lipotypes analyze many human cohorts and contribute to multiple clinical trials. And from these data, we have made the first steps to establish a health score. And the plasma and blood lipidome will form the basis for a personalized health score. And that's our future uh, uh, goal. And we have 300, over 300 different lipid indices, which we have identified, which can be part of the, of the health score. Uh, uh, and, 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 and we will use this blood lipidome to follow how interventions, for instance, changes in the diet affect our personal health score. And, and therefore we have this traffic light here and green will be a positive development of your health score. If you have an intervention, I'll show you. Yellow for a neutral development, red for a negative development. So here we have a study, a lipotype intervention study done in our own, own company. So here, uh, phase zero, starting we take a, a lipotype dead life spot test, two of them to get a good value. And then two weeks, we have an individual intervention. And then we take again two samples and, this, and look whether any changes has taken place in the blood lipidome. Then we have two weeks again, and again an intervention, and then we take the, the samples. And what have we done? We have phase one, many people was individual, but many people chose to do eat fish. So after that, after the 14 days, they had 10 to 12 times fish. Uh, uh, uh. And you can see all of those who were eating fish, uh, this is the health score now going up based on the lipid indexes. You can see how different people are reacting. And phase two, we used seven milliliters of olive oil, very good for you. Uh, and you see all of them going up. So here you see that even a such a short intervention as two weeks can be seen. So now we have here the, this is just a two dimensional feature space of lipidomes, uh, 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 plasma lipidomes, because we haven't done enough blood lipidomes yet. Uh, we have done 15,000, 20,000 of them. And now we, 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 we uh, mark the areas where the normals are, obesity, Alzheimer, coronary events, multiple sclerosis, diabetes. And then we do an intervention. We use the first measurement. This one is a little outside, bit outside the normal range. And then we have intervention. Uh, and then we move in, into better, uh, 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 into, into the normal area. So this is what we want to do. Our goal is prevention with lipidomic profiling for personalized health. Can we help to stem the obesity pandemic to live up, live up to our slogan, lipidomics for a better life? So think about the COVID pandemic. What could we have done without an assay for the SARS virus? And that's the situation we have for the obesity pandemic. We have nothing. As we, don't, we have to wait until the, the, the people get ill. And that's too late. So we have plenty of work to do. Also to understand what is going wrong in induced metabolism and establishing assays that can be used to help us navigate. And here's just finally something that is characteristic of the, of the obesity unhealthy weight pandemic. It's a, a phrase called metabolic food waste. So 
all those overweight and obese people eat more than normal weight people. And the overall impact, the metabolic food waste in the world corresponds to 140 million tons of food. Consumption is 230 kilograms annually per average person. This means that we could feed 600 million people if our lifestyle still would be the same as before the US Senate committee gave their disastrous recommendation in 1977. It's amazing. So I have come to the end. So since the lipids are cool again, perhaps we can help to make earth cool again. And that we do by having a planet with happy human beings living sustainably. sustainably. Lippies are back and you can now go to work. Thank you.